get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, our sponsor is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges, and they leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Today, I'm very excited. We have Jason Friedman, who's founder of CX Formula. He helps fast-growing entrepreneurial companies gain an unfair advantage over their competition. He's going to go through how, how you can do it, how he's done it for other companies. His clients range from solopreneurs to companies like Adidas, Nike, Universal Studios, Disney, Bank of America, Stanford, Harvard, it goes on and on. It's pretty amazing. In in 2008, Jason sold his first company, Creative Realities, in the high eight figures. Congratulations, that's amazing. He has started and successfully exited four other businesses. Jason, thanks for joining me. Awesome. Thanks thanks for having me, Jeremy. I'm excited to be here. There's so much we can dig into. Um, And I want to hear about, first of all, how you got some of these clients and then what you did for them. But I want to start off with a fun fact about you. And sure. you started off in as a lighting designer director for who are some of the people that you did that for early on? I mean, I, I mean, I was I was a theater person. You know, I went to school for theater, and I was you know primarily in lighting, but I did everything from set design and built costumes and you name it. But after that, uh, I had a good fortune to go out on the road with uh, a couple rock and roll groups like Rush, Peter Gabriel. Um, and Fleetwood Mac uh, and do some tours with them. And it was a uh, truly phenomenal experience. Um, you know, it's the, it was that dream that I had when I was a kid. I, Were you, know, you a musician growing up or? I mean, I was a musician. Uh, I was a trumpet player though, not a, not a rock and roll kind of musician, but uh, you know, but I always loved music. Music's a big part of my life. And uh, I really, uh, I love, I loved it, you know, and, but I, I was at summer camp one year and I heard Rush for the first time. This kid was in a talent show and he sang The Spirit of Radio. And uh, I was like, I, I like this song, you know. And, and I started buying their albums and listening to all their albums and yeah. uh, I got hooked. I, I started looking at the cover art, you know, inside the CD cases back in the old days when we buy CDs and uh, saw who the lighting company was. And Really? Uh, was Why like, the you know, lighting company? Oh, so you. I was always in theater. I always enjoyed it. So it was kind of a mix. When I saw this kid do the talent show, I was doing some lighting for the the camp show, and I was the guy that was running the lights, flashing the red and the blue and the green and all that on stage, and um, and so I was like, oh, I wonder who does their lighting, and uh, and I kind of got such an that interesting way. question. So why yeah. were you into lighting early on? You know, um, I liked the performing arts. I liked theater. I liked uh, yeah. sh- you know showmanship, if you will. And uh, what I what I think you know now I can articulate it then differently than I would have then. But I I liked the combination of right brain and left brain mix. Like it was the way to be creative and artistic and yeah. and also like you had to get it done. You had to build stuff and and stage a show. And there was a definite start you know point for when the curtain would go up and right. there would be an audience and the adrenaline of of performing. Not that I was a performer. I was backstage, but the the performance and you know the the audience clapping and just the energy and that was yeah. uh, it's kind of intoxicating to me so so were your parents uh, into musicals and, and music or what where'd you get this not from? at no, all not i at have all. no idea i am i am not sure <laughs> <laughs> i just i just kind of just kind of got hooked on it you know and i always liked kind of technical stuff and and um engineering kind of stuff you know I, I mean my parents have pictures of me when i was a kid um taking apart stuff just to see how it worked and you know, theater was again. It's a kind of mix. Like you know, you had to build stuff from scratch and figure it out, and all the the technical, like tactical kind of stuff that you do. But then there's also that kind of creative and dreaming and imagining and kind of making something up and then seeing it kind of happen. So yeah. uh, it was always pretty fun. Um, so Jason, I, tell me the, one of the craziest stories on the road. Because oh my god! You you know you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is going on iTunes. I can't tell all the stories. Um, There's but, no filter here. We'll just put explicit yeah, on the yeah, iTunes thing and everything's fair game. 
No, I mean, like, I, I mean, one of one of my favorite um, experiences was because uh, how old to... are you at the time when you're traveling with these bands? I mean, I, I got right out of school. I, I graduated a little bit early and uh, like 21, 22. Yeah. Um, so I was pretty young. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, so I got to go to Woodstock 1994. So the second Woodstock uh, with Peter Gabriel. And it was phenomenal. I mean, it was just I mean, it was disgusting, too. I mean, there was like too many people there it was overcrowded. People were just like living there. They would, you know, go to the bathroom right there in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it was it was, it was crazy. But, uh, you know, being there with the crew and having backstage access and being able to kind of go wherever we want. We had our tour bus there, so we had a place to sleep. And um, it was a very different experience um, being on that side. And it was it was just amazing. And the energy from all the fans and the, yeah. the people there and, and just the, the culture of it was was truly uh, – I mean, I'd never experienced anything like it. Yeah. So that was one of my favorite moments uh, in there. You know, I also had a kind of a sad moment too where mm-hmm. – um, with Fleetwood Mac, um, it was kind of on their way down for a while and Stevie Nicks wasn't with them. And, uh, we were touring through like, I would say not a venues, not B venues, not C venues, maybe like D venues. Like what's considered, like, give me an example of like a D venue. Like, like a bar that's got a lot of seats, (laughs) you know, like, like, like this, like name, you know, headlining act was no longer like playing in Madison square garden. They were playing in like Joe's pub kind of thing. So we were playing. Like like venues on the outskirts of cities, B cities, C cities, D cities, like not your not New York City. You know, we were like in Paducah, Kentucky, or or something. Not, I know some people against, from Paducah. Yeah. Uh, nothing <laughs> nothing against Paducah, a great yeah. place, but not where Fleetwood Mac as a right. group wanted to necessarily be. And so yeah. I remember we went into one venue and the ceilings were so low that we couldn't use any of our lighting rig, and we had tractor trailers full of stuff. Wow. And so the the ceiling was so low, the stage was so small, it like literally just fit the band. We had to take one of our overhead trusses that would fly with all the lights on it and stand it up on its side and just sit it on the floor next to the stage. So the lights were just shining on the stage. Yeah. And I remember uh, Mick Fleetwood walked in and uh, his kit, drum kit was all set up and everything. And he looked around and he was so angry that he was there. He threw his sticks and stormed out and nobody was sure if he was even going to come back. So you know, it was kind of watching you know, a legendary kind of group yeah. in a very different place. And it, it was it was sad and it was um, – but you know, again, it was still it was fun to be out with them. Um, it was fun to to have the experience, and they had fans that were diehard fans for you know decades yeah. um, coming through and stuff. So, you know, it was a bittersweet. What did you it. see, Jason, with that with the mentality behind that? Because obviously, they still probably get up for every show, no matter if it's in Madison Square Garden or Paducah, Kentucky. What did you see with the mindset of the band? Because that's a tough it's a tough road, right? Yeah, I mean, so sort of I, reflects I, entrepreneurship a lot. Of, well, you know. yeah, and that's kind of my whole take. You know, I, I took my my experience in theater and 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 all of that and brought it into the business world, and it served very well um, for myself and my clients. So I think you're right. Like, but the thing that was interesting about that, I don't I don't think they had a good mindset at that point. That that specific group, you know, they came in and it should have been about the customer, regardless of where they were, and right. putting on a great show. People people paid money to come and, and have an experience. And, um, and they, at that venue, for example, the, the experience was not, in my opinion, you know, what they should have had, you know, right. it was way lower than an experience. And I think that's important to kind of, you know, parallel that to business. If you, you know, like you said, like if a customer pays you, uh, to, to, to deliver a product or a service, so you need to deliver that product or service to the best of your ability, yeah. you know? Uh, and I think in that situation, it wasn't necessarily, yeah. Uh, it wasn't necessarily done the right way. You know, I want to go back to when you branched off um, on your own. But first, I want to talk about when did you realize, okay, I need to focus on this customer service, customer formula thing? So, um, well, the, kind of the whole evolution is part of the story, if yeah. you don't mind. I'll kind of just Yeah, go ahead. So when did you it, branch but, off on your own then? Yeah, so, you know, once I, I was on the road, I was doing that for a while. And what I loved about it was the creating the show, the putting the show together, the the staging of it. And once you got it up and working and everything, all the problems were ironed out and it was running kind of smoothly, I, it was it was monotonous to me. So I didn't love it as much. I loved the, 
the the production part, not the operations part. If you yeah. were the, the the startup part, if you were related yeah. to business, this is like the big corporation just running, like and figuring out where to set everything up, how it should look, and then just doing and it efficiently and how to make sure that we were optimizing what we were doing and you know going under budget and using less hours for setup and really making it efficient. Once you got it there, like yeah. operate creating the systems were always fun to me. Operating the systems thereafter were not quite as fun yeah. to me. Not that there's anything wrong with that. That has yeah. to happen. So you're more of like a visionary type of person who kind of likes the big picture. Not uh, I like both. I like both, but I don't like the the monotonous operation of a system. I love to right. create it, get it fine tuned and worked out. But then I, as far as like just running it all over and over, I get a little bit bored. You know, right, my, right. my my entrepreneurial ADD kicks in, and I want to go on to the next thing. For sure. So that's why I did so many different tours and things. Like I would get it up to a certain point, then I would usually like replace myself with someone else, and then yeah, I'd go so and do long. the next one because it was more fun um, for me. And so when I went to, uh, I was I was doing that for a while, and I got a call from someone who was like, look, we're, we're going to be building a, a, a program, a store of the future for this brand, Foot Locker. Hmm. And, um, and we want to put like theatrical stuff in there. We want to put like some cool lights and video and, and sounds and, and all that. And we need, you know, some people that have experience in yeah. the theater arts kind of stuff doing that. And so I had the opportunity to come in and, and work on that project yeah. um, in a very infancy pilot stage uh, with a couple other people. And it was, um, it was awesome. Uh, I mean, it was very similar to theater in some ways and radically different in other ways. And it was like it was a really interesting mix of how do you bring that that thinking and that that ideation of, of theater and, right. and storytelling and showmanship and then put it into a retail store? How do you put it in something that's just got to be just running all the time and, right. and doesn't have that audience coming at a certain time? It's, it's just all the time. Yeah. So it was a lot of fun. And what I learned very quickly there um, I mean, as a theater person, you always you're always clear on the audience is is who's paying you. They're they're who you're doing it for. Right. In retail, you know, it's the customer. But but there, we started to learn more about the customer. We got into so much more detail about who the customer was than than Foot Locker had ever done. Like what? What what did you discover that they didn't even realize? Well, so we started to look at different ways that people would shop or different ways that they would like to meander through the store. And we started to look at patterns and observe patterns and, and things that just, again, nobody was really measuring that or looking at it that intently. And our goal was to find a way to engage the shopper more at the point of purchase. So, and this is, this is more, uh, more commonplace today than it was back then. It was, and, and the impetus, like the catalyst that started this whole thing off was the internet was becoming bigger. Shopping online was becoming bigger. So yeah. retailers weren't competing with online shopping really yet. It just was starting. And so it was like, if if people can go online and find other pricing and do comparative shopping and, and leave, not leave their home and just kind of sit in their pajamas and, and buy stuff, what would make it exciting for them to come in the store? Why, why would the in-store experience be worth putting on your clothes and getting out in the car and right. going? So it was about how do we make it more fun? How do we make it more engaging? That's even more more important, I would say, now. People are making more online purchases it's, than ever. Well, and I think it's more important for online businesses to think about that too because there's yeah. so many other ones. So why why shop on your website or why spend time on your online platform? Right. It's it's and, and I think this has been a problem for, for centuries. This is not new. It's just it, you know, it becomes you know, more focused. It just and changes. It changes, exactly, in the transition. So – so, anyway, so we, we put together a program that literally mapped out the entire journey that the customer would go on through mm -hmm. the store. And we found that there were different kind of archetypal kinds of customers yeah. that had similarities. And so we could speak to each of them as a unique group so that they felt special and they felt um, like they were important and they were cared for. And so by creating and weaving this this tapestry of experiences for all these different kinds of people together and deliberately um, – creating the journey that they would go on so that when they would come in the store, they would, they would kind of feel compelled to go a certain way. We were now guiding them through that experience and we controlled it more for them and we made it more, um, uh, I guess more accessible to them. We, we shared more with them in ways that they weren't used to. So that they stopped and they, they paid attention. And so through that experience, we were able to increase the same store sales by over 400%. Yeah. So it was no, it was it was worth it. You know, it was like it was no accident that these things happened. We were very deliberate and intentional in what we were doing. Yeah.
So yeah. walk me through one of the archetypes. Like who, what was one of them and what, what were some of the things that you did to help uh, kind of boost their customer experience? So, uh, I mean, we're going back quite a ways, so forgive me if I, I'm a little <laughs> I'm bit off on a few of these things. The yeah, like we're, we're blowing off cobwebs here. Um, but, you know, there was, a, there was an urban youth, right? So it was a uh, 13 to 17-year-old male that lived in a, in a city uh, environment that was interested in um, sports, uh, basketball, right. street street sports and things that they would play pickup games and things like that. Yeah. Um, and they were interested in what was considered high fashion at that time, connected to stars and athletes that they were most interested in, most excited about, but also the mindset shift of why the the different pieces of clothing or apparel were going to help their game and inspire them to be better. Right. So it was like this inspirational message to them of how they could become better by by buying these sneakers or wearing these shoes or or using this bat or whatever the accessory was that we were we were selling. Yeah. And so they were being inspired um, at the point of purchase and put into a mood that was ex- exciting them and, and and giving them an aspirational uh, place to go that really connected with them in their heart and. And so they would want to be connected uh, more to certain um, certain pro athletes or or certain brands or things like that. So as they went through the store, we had stories that would unfold. So there was media that would play and different factoids would pop up on screens that would hmm. inspire them to want to, you know, the, the, the farthest um, someone ever stood from a basketball hoop and what they were wearing and what they were doing at that time, for example. So like if they were someone that was hardcore into basketball and they were, you know, wanted to, to improve their um, – you know, their swoosh from, you know, really far away, it would give them some information about that and, and inspire them to maybe try that. And, you know, you need the right tools if you're going to do that too. So you need the right sneakers and you need the right, you know, socks and, and whatever. kind of stuff. So it wasn't as dependent on like staff delivering. It was a lot of like media stuff or things kind of in the actual store that would help kind of guide the experience also. So I would say it was a really good mix of both of those. So um, there was a lot of staff training that went on that, that so that they understood their role. So, you know, one of the things that I talk about when it comes to customer experience, you, you know, you have to start inside your company. You, you design what you want your customer experience to be for your customers, but then you have to start looking at how do you deliver it. And it starts with your employees, your team members. Right. What we use is a, is a term we call position mission. So instead of giving your team members a job description, we want you to give them a position mission, Mm -hmm. help them understand their big why Mm -hmm. and how that why connects to your brand's why, connects to your customer's why. And just even if you're an employee that's not on the front lines, you have a team member that's behind the scenes, two or three levels removed from a direct interaction with the customer, their role is critical to that customer experience. Even if they're like an accounting person who's not interacting, what they do is mission critical for the success of the business, for for the experience that the customers have. So by connecting the position missions across and through, um, it really opens people's eyes up to a lot of different things. And and, and I think it empowers people and creates, awakens more of a passion um, and a, and a level of, um, responsibility within each team member because they see how yeah. all these things that they do really do matter. Um, so, you know, we always say like that why, if, if everyone understands why first, how becomes super easy. And then all the things that we normally spend most of our time training on, like the skills or the, the checklist of things someone has to do throughout the day, yeah. is the secondary level of training. The first level of training is on the customer and the mission and how those right. things come. Right. So, we, so we, as it relates to that, that job, it was about showing them how they were a they were a guide they were a um a coach so i mean they used to all the full locker people had the referee shirts right, on exactly and, yeah. right but so we talked to them about being more of a coach so you're here to coach these people through how to how to be better athletes or be better um you know basketball players or what have you and we gave them more knowledge and training about why this stuff works like product knowledge that they you know, most of the people that were there were you know, young teenagers that were working at right, the store. In high school. And they yeah. were about yeah, and they were about selling a pair of shoes and and how to ring it up on the register, not knowing more about the product knowledge so that they could, you know, show someone why this shoe might be better than that shoe. So yeah. there was a lot more training and focus on that too, but also on on letting the the customer enjoy the experience. So it wasn't like you know a vulture attack. As soon as a customer walked in, everyone swarmed and said, "Can I help you?" 
they knew that they were helped and there were people strategically placed around the store right. and there was messaging that would say, hey, you know, go talk to this person. We might flash a picture of one of the employees up with their name and a couple cool facts like they're, they they love basketball or they love this. So that would encourage someone to go talk to that person. Yeah, it makes and it real personal. It, it, it does. It changes the level of interaction. We did a similar thing with uh, with banks, you know. Um, Bank of America. Yeah, example. tell me how you make banks sexy. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that I would say that I, we made them sexy, but we made it more accessible. Like one of the yeah. ways that banks, like for a long time, people thought of banks as the teller line, right? So you walk in, you, you can cash a check or you can deposit some money or whatever. The majority of the money is made on the platform. Like when you go and you get a home equity loan or a line of credit or something else or you invest or whatever. And so people don't want to feel dumb about money and they're afraid to ask questions in a bank because they, they don't want to look they don't want to look stupid. They don't want to look like they're they're not um, knowledgeable. Right. So what we would do is we would give them bits and bites of education that would make them feel knowledgeable and make it um, comfortable for them to go ask a question yeah. about something. So we'd give them enough information so that they knew enough to be dangerous, if you will. So they would feel um, comfortable going to talk to somebody. And we also introduced team members within the the branch, for example, on the media system too, so that they would get to know a name and a face and humanize them. So it wasn't some big banker, like this guy's got 2.3 kids, has a white picket fence, a dog, and and likes to boat. Right. So now you know a little bit about some of the people, you'll be comfortable going to talk to them and strike up a conversation. And it really changed things quite a bit. Another thing that we would do you know, with banks, like one of the problems that they had was, uh, especially with um, with all the different rate quoting stuff that was uh, in the media. It's like, oh, you can get a, a better uh, interest rate on, on a CD from us. So people would literally see, oh, this bank has a better rate. I'm going to take all my money out of this one bank and I'm going to bring it to another bank. And so they would be like, they would lose customers like right and left and back and forth. Well, we found that online banking and online bill pay specifically was a retention strategy for banks. So if people would set up all their stuff on their bank uh, for online banking and bill pay, well, they wouldn't so quickly go and switch banks to another to another bank at that point. Right. It was we created an engagement strategy in store that would use online kiosks and things so that they could see and play with the banking system when they happened to be in there. It was kind of cool looking technology. You had some media that explained what it did. But then we also set it up so that instead of having a teller line with this glass and and broken up, we would have ways for the the bank tellers to actually stand next to. Um, people that were there stand next to their customers and and shake their hand and not have this like barrier like saying it's like us a bulletproof them. glass yeah exactly so yeah. not to say that we made money you know put money out in the open so people could just steal it but we <laughs> we created opportunities for human interaction right. to happen better and we would we would put in programs like um, we'll help you transfer all your all your banking uh, all your bill pay onto our system so that it's easy it's done for you yeah. we made it an effortless experience for the customers and churn went dropped like they didn't lose customers so quickly anymore because they were more engaged and more connected and they started to know people at the branch like it was about you know this big huge bank with thousands and thousands of locations but you went to one location primarily right so how do you start to develop a relationship with the people that are in your jurisdiction if you will so that are in your you know geographic area and you start to know them so when you'd come in you know, they would they would feel welcome. They would feel like it was a home. You know, it was a place that they're comfortable in. So, Jason, how do you roll that out? So, like, typically, do you go into one Bank of America, kind of design the experience, and do they roll it in other branches, or is it usually on a case by case basis? I mean, it depended on the the client. You know, so that was that was back in a in a in a previous business that we were doing that. But what we would do is we'd do a pilot location or locations usually, um, and test out a new concept and get it refined. And then once we got it to the place where we were happy and everyone was uh, kind of signed off on, yeah, this is great, then we would start to roll it out. And we would roll it out on a, um, different levels. So there'd be like an A store, a B store, a C store, a D store, based on the demographic that it was in, based on the size and scale, the, the population density, right. you know, things like that. And, you know, we would roll out thousands of locations. And the way we did it, our, our kind of secret sauce was, was that theater thing. Again, it was a uh, touring. So when you take a show on the road, you have to package this thing up so it'll come out of the truck and go together very simply, very right. easily. So we we would kit up all these different, you know, components and and systems and the technologies and the training and all that, and we would roll it out so that there was a very defined, prescribed system for how it would show up at the place. 
the local contractors that had to do something with it had instructions and videos and diagrams and things were color coded. So you'd plug the blue wire to the blue wire and the red wire to the red wire. And, you know, so we made it as we called it Fisher pricing it at the time, right? It's like, how do you make it simple and easy? So the experience for the contractors, because they were a customer too, you know, we had the bank as a customer, we had contractors as a customer, architects as a customer. How do we make the customer experience through every touch point as seamless and consistent and effortless as humanly possible? So we so, spent a lot of time doing that. You know, what's interesting, Jason, I can see directly how Universal Studios and Disney would immediately see the value in that. How do you get Bank of America and Fidelity to see the value? Do they come to you? How does that work? Um, well, so, I mean, at, at the time, we, we had a strategy to go out and show what we were capable of by creating an experience in our whole sales process. So our sales mm -hmm. process, you know, we would go out and we would meet with architects or branding firms at the time or groups that were working with larger brands on how do you create a, a, a future concept, like a store of the future or an event of the future right. or a, um, you know, you name it, or, a, or a, maybe it was like an executive briefing center or a corporate headquarters where you wanted to have this like really huge wow experience for people. So we would go in and we would do what we, you know, they would do like at an architect firm. If you want to get in and pitch an architect firm on your, on your wares, like a, you're a Formica company, what you do is you go and do what they call a lunch and learn. So you buy a plate of sandwiches and you get a bunch of the architects come in for lunch and while they're eating lunch, you get to show them your latest Formica samples and why your Formica is better than the other guys. Right. Ever. So that was the, the, the model that was created that we had to go and sell into. Right. What we want to do is how do we differentiate ourselves from anybody else that comes in there? And so what we created was what we called the sushi and learn experience. So I mean, we would do, count me in. Yeah. Yeah. Go yeah ahead. Right. So it was just different. You know, not everyone likes sushi. We'd have some teriyaki and some other cooked food for people that didn't like it. But we had an invitation. So we'd invite the entire firm and we had a, an RSVP process. So that was different already. Like they had an RSVP and we say, look, we're bringing in sushi. We're, we have a chef that's making special rolls. We need to know if you're going to come. So just by that nature alone, we had more people sign up to even attend our lunch and lunch. Right. Then we would have a little bit of research done on the firm so we would name the roles after projects that they've done mm, so that it was cool. customized to that firm that we were in then we would actually have a uh, we'd hire a local sushi vendor you know sushi restaurant or whatever and we'd have a standard kind of checklist and order form on our backstage process that we would present to them and we would have them make 85 percent of all the food and deliver it but the deal was that they had to have one of their sushi chefs come up and prepare like a half a dozen of them in person so that it was an actual show and we had a we had a um a chef's hat and a, a chef coat thing that had our logo on it and so the sushi chef would be there branded we had water bottles with our logo on it we had napkins with our logos it's an experience you know, yeah. everything was branded everything was tight and 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 managed and so when the the people would come in they'd be like oh my god they'd be bringing in their cameras and their phones and they'd be snapping pictures and and calling other people that hadn't rsvp to come in and see this and you know we would say to them like what you need to do with your clients is you need to create an unforgettable experience. You need yeah. to stand out among the crowd. You need radical differentiation just like we're doing here. So what we want you to think of is when the next time you have an opportunity to come up with some kind of engagement strategy to, to activate the brand in the hearts and minds of their customers, yeah. we want you to think of us, the sushi guys, right? And so we were branding ourselves along that, but we wanted them to have triggers to think of us in different things. And so what we offer to them and is we would we would actually go through a series of um, examples of ways that we could like sharing our ideas like how could we do this so we would take um, a key project that they did and we would compliment them on things that we thought were really good and we'd say you know here's a couple other things that you might think of the next time you do a project like this and we give them some ideas and then we would set up for um, little private consult uh, consultation sent uh, sessions from like literally right after that sushi learn for weeks after and they would bring us in to, to brainstorm mm. on all these different projects they have and then when we come up with great ideas they would actually engage us or they would refer us to their client directly and their client would hire us so it was a way of engaging them and we once we did that uh, our business literally took off i mean we had a, a lot of other things that we did that were part of the strategy but but that alone like our sales process was transformational was about creating the experience, understanding who they were. So we would give them, you know, what internet marketers today might call lead magnets and, and free content that was right. valuable. So we'd give them calculators for things like one of the challenges that architects always had was 
how do I figure out how much space I have to block out if I want to put in some cool technology in a retail store? Right. We had like a calculator tool that we created that would show them based on the kind of things you'd want to put in, how much physical space would you need? How much cooling would you need? How much extra power would you need? So we created tools and and free content that was valuable to them, understanding where their challenges were that would you know give them all the answers that they need, give them the help that they need and make them you know, feel some reciprocity towards bringing us in and, and, right. and engaging with us. So we were very clear on who our customers were, where, what was keeping them up at night, what was frustrating them, what needs they had. And then we just put together a program where we could have um, a major engagement strategy. And then we had a whole, you know, kind of drip content strategy, if you will. So how do we continue to give them content and deliver value? So we weren't out of mind, out of sight. We were always kind of there. We would always do stuff. And, yeah. you know, it was huge. It was huge. That's, um, you know, <laughs> I'm thinking like, I'm thinking, well, what if someone's saying, uh, I'm not as creative as Jason, right? Um, what are some ways you spark your creative ability to even think of the sushi chef and the sushi and then going in and, and you, it takes a lot of work, you know, obviously to um, do research on what projects are doing, how you can add value to those projects from the creativity side. That doesn't. That seems to be a strong suit of yours. What are some ways that you kind of get your create your creative juices flowing to think of these type of ideas? So um, I think um, I've never really met a person that's not creative in some way. Yeah. A lot of people like to say they're not creative because they can't draw a straight line, or they can't draw a picture, they can't paint something, or whatever. And there's like artistic creativity, and then there's a lot of other creativity. So I think anyone that's in business today. Uh, can solve problems and they can figure things out. So, so I think that part of it's just a limiting belief that most of us have that we can't be creative mm -hmm. enough. So I, 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 I don't buy that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna push back and say I don't. If anyone's saying right now that we're not creative enough, that's not true. You are creative enough. What you need is a framework to hang the creativity on and yeah. to think and to put it through a thinking process. And so a lot of what you know what my business CX formula does is we give people the tools and the processes and we call it the CX formula, the formula of how to put these things in place. So not to say that it's not some work and you don't have to do some thinking, but it's a lot easier when we kind of break it down and you think in like little sprints and little segments and think about how to do that. So the way that I like to start is kind of counterintuitive to most people. Um, I like to start at the end. So what I do is I have you say, all right, you just finished this interaction, whether it's a, like a lunch and learn or um, coming to your chiropractic uh, practice and having an adjustment or whatever the end mm -hmm. of that engagement right. is. And I want you to like think very clearly about your customer and I want you to know what would they, in an ideal world, what would you most want them to say to somebody about what just happened? And I want you to use a lot of adjectives. I want you a lot to use a lot of words and like very, very vividly describe what you would want them to tell somebody else. Like right. if they were going to refer you to someone yeah. or they were sitting on an airplane and someone said, hey, what, what have you been up to? Oh my God, I just left this unbelievable blank. Fill in that blank, and, and then right. so I got there, and 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 I was greeted by this person. It was the nicest person I've ever met. And then right. instead of like sitting in a waiting room for five hours, they brought me here, and there was like amazing, you know, whatever it was. Right. Go through that process and just talk about what it is that yeah. you would want them to say. That's really helpful, yeah. Right, and I call that the ideal customer script. Write the ideal yeah. customer script down, and once you do that, it's like that's like the why how thing to some extent like once you have that picture of what that end result is now mm. you can kind of go back and reverse engineer what you need to do to make that happen so for yeah. us we wanted them the architects to leave that meeting saying oh my god these guys just opened our eyes to like a thousand different ways that mm. we can add some cool um experiential elements into an experience and sometimes it doesn't even have to cost anything we wanted them to think it doesn't even have to cost anything and and like, and, and they're available, like they'll brainstorm with us, they'll help us. They, they were so giving with ideas and, and, and thoughts and, and they gave us all these valuable tools that would help us. So even when they're not around, we could just get some stuff done. We could get things done for our clients faster. Right. We could bring state of the art ideas of technology solutions or, or engagement solutions to our clients. Our competitors as an architect, our competitors wouldn't be able to do that. So we wrote that script and then we said, okay, how do we deliver that? Right. And, and one of the things that we learned very quickly is 
and, and I use this quote. There's a, a famous quote from the poet uh, Maya Angelou. Uh, I'm not sure if, you, if, if everyone listening is familiar, but she was a, a very famous poet. She was on an interview with Oprah, and Oprah was asking her a bunch of questions about, you know, the way she saw the world and such. And, and one of the things she said was, you know, people don't always remember the things you said, and people don't always remember the things that you do, but they always remember the way you made them feel. Right, right. So to me, what we started to think more about was what was the feelings? Like yeah. well, these are all the things we're doing, but what are the feelings? Now the things that we do, if we engineer them right, if we if we literally map out the process just like we do with Foot Locker, well, we can get them to feel that way authentically because we're delivering value all the way. So we want them to feel grateful. We want them to feel excited. We want them to feel motivated. We want them to feel like they found a, a new strategy, like this this new tool, this arrow in their quiver that they could pull out and they could use on the next project when they needed to. So for anyone that's out there thinking about it, like start begin with the end in mind. Yeah. Start by understanding what you want your customers to say about you yeah. after each interaction. And yeah. how do you want them to feel at the end of each interaction? And then we can literally put the pieces in place that will guide us there. And with our Sushi and Learn, we did that. And then we brought in and we would then give them some ideas for their own project. So it was in context. Because and the reason that we use some of their projects, like we didn't get too detailed and we didn't criticize work that they did. Um, you know, at least not at first. Like if they asked us, like, well, how would you have done this differently? Yeah. We'd be honest and authentic. But what we would do is we would use things that they had a frame of reference for. Yeah. So that then when we added more context to it, they were already familiar with it. They would be excited about it, yeah, and 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 really understand it and appreciate it. You know, Jason, thank you for sharing that. And I think, you know, this this is not to be taken lightly. I, I'm sure p businesses have paid six and probably even seven figures to to hear your advice on this and walk them through this exact experience. So I don't take this advice. I hope no one takes this advice lightly. Um, cause that, you know, the ideal customer script gives anyone a framework to kind of start with that. So absolutely. Know, that's amazing. It's, it's Thank a you. Powerful tool. And the, the, the second thing that I would do, or, or maybe even the first, and then I would go to the ideal customer script is yeah. I would go way, way deeper in understanding of your customers and you want to segment them so that you have, like I was talking about earlier, these archetypal customers right. and, and on the internet and the internet marketing world, people call them avatars. Um, I like to think of them as what we call customer personas. Yeah. I like the word persona. It reminds me all the time that these are actually people. Right. Um, I think Avatar, sometimes they become this like weird gaming thing and <laughs> an icon and we forget that they're right. actually people with emotions. Yeah. But what we want to do is we want to look at all of our customer base or, or even customers that we aspire to have that maybe aren't our customers now and even customers that we've fired or that are not a good fit. We want to look at them and we want to start to analyze them in a very deep, deep way. And one of the again kind of drawing from the theater experience we use this this um this method called the stanislavski system which was invented by a ross uh, um a russian theater director um konstantin stanislavski and he believed that people need to be super super authentic when they're acting on stage otherwise the people in the audience they won't believe what's happening yeah, they're yeah. just not going to buy the show so he uh, was frustrated by actors that were unbelievable and so he came up with this process to help them be more believable. And, and it basically starts by putting yourself in the shoes of whatever role you're playing. So yeah. if you're going to play the character of a terminally ill patient that's in a hospital with yeah. their last days. How could you play that authentically if you don't, if you haven't investigated that, if you don't really know right. what's going through the mind of someone that's facing the end of their life and what are their family feeling, uh, you know, fa family members feeling around them and such. Yeah. So he gave this, this idea called the magic if. And he would ask, what you, you know, as, as you're thinking about your the role you're going to play, what you know, what is like if I were that person, how would I be feeling? If I were in that situation, what obstacles might I be facing? If I were in that situation, what what would I want to accomplish? What would I most want to have happen? You know, what would I most be regretful for? What would I most be excited about? Mm. Whatever those those ifs are. Yeah. So we use that as a framework, and we start to look at our customers and in a deeper way and, and, and role play a little bit, get inside yeah. them, put yourself put in the their shoes glasses. as much as you can. Yeah. And, and do some real research on those yeah. people. Some of it might be going out and interviewing them and asking some of your customers some questions. Some of it yeah. might be, um, you know, online surveys. Some of it might be this kind of role playing. Some of it might be looking at how 
um, other brands interact with certain kinds of archetypal mm-hmm. customers and, and, and really getting clear. But once you get to a level of depth of understanding of your customers, it's really easy to provide the right value to the right customer at the right time. Because as you start to map out the journey, all the different touch points that a customer has from when they're your, they're your prospect all the way through to when they become a customer and, and hopefully a lifelong loyal customer, you can deliver the right kind of things for each one. And not every customer is the same. So as a business, you might find that you have four or five or three or seven you know, archetypes of customers that right. work with you on different various products or services or, or things that you sell. And so the more that you can get really clear for each of them, what their frustrations are, what their goals are, what they need most, even what kind of communication do they like? Do they like a phone call? Do they like emails? Do they like... Um, websites, do they like podcasts, whatever it is that that is best suited to their modality, you can start to be more and more relevant to them. And the gratitude that gets, you know, built up between the two and and the relationship gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And there's where loyalty and lifelong relationships come from. Yeah. And I just listened to, it's funny you mentioned that, Jason, because I just listened to the book Originals by Adam Grant, and they talk about exactly what you're saying and how people... Well, it's called like method acting or... or yeah, method yeah, acting right. instead of sausage system, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, so they talk about it in, in the context of, you know, kind of understanding, you know, the people, the role, whatever you're you're going for. So it's really interesting. Yeah, it's such a great, powerful thing. I mean, we, we would do exercises inside our company too. You need to do the same thing. So when I talk about customers, I think of them... I'm going to elevate it to audience. So everyone that's kind of surrounding your business. Right. And it's also inside, like your employees are customers too. Your vendors, your, you know, everyone, your affiliates, your partners, your joint ventures, everyone. And so if you do this exercise for everyone, you get this level of depth in understanding. And, and now you can start to deliver more and more. So for me, one of the things that we would do in our businesses is we would actually do role playing by department and then do it interdepartmentally too. So, for example, I would take all my customer service reps that were on the phone dealing with problems, and I would have them role play different scenarios of customers calling in to complain or having an issue or having a problem. And we would go through um, a whole series of that. And what would happen is the, the, the employees, they did understand our customers' frustration on a very surface level. But once they got in and they had to become that customer and argue on their behalf and kind of debate it with one Mm -hmm. of our people that was being our person – there was a whole different level of enlightenment right. that happened. So now, whether <laughs> a little they more cared for people, yeah. well, it, they're getting it, right? Because like they might have that same experience at home with the cable company. So they knew what the things were. They're they detached from they it the a content. little bit. Right. They are yeah. very detached. So it, it attaches them. And then now they understand, instead of their position mission statement from a, from a call center representative to be, I got to solve their problem, it's I've got to make them happy. Hmm. So it's a shift it's 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 um it's a nuance but it is a big difference so the first thing we would do is we would apologize saying you know we're so sorry that you had to spend time on your day to deal with a problem like you shouldn't have to do that and we're a little bit embarrassed by that so what i want to do is i want to do everything in my power to get you back up and running as quickly and i don't even want to ask you to take any more time out of your schedule but i can very quickly, if you can give me three or four more minutes of your time, I can decide whether or not I need to ship out a technician or a piece of equipment or or both, and that way I can get you up and running faster. Would you would you be so kind to give us a few more minutes of your time? Right. All of a sudden, everyone's like, yes. Whereas originally it was like, I don't care, I'm not involved. Like this is your problem. Send somebody out, and they'd hang up on us. So by by right. understanding them and, and yeah. being able to empathize, it was a whole different level of engagement, and relationships were built. You know, so um, you know, it's a pretty important uh, concept. It's I the think. most important, yeah. So what were yeah. some of your favorite position missions you heard from different companies or your own? I mean, so my, my, my all-time favorite and perhaps one of the most important I've ever had was the, the quote-unquote receptionist in my, my own company. Um, we called her the director of first impressions, um, and we were using that title long before most other people were, and we taught people about that. But the premise is that, you know, Every single person that called our company talked to this person. Like right. I didn't talk to everyone as the CEO of the company. I didn't talk to everybody. Right. Um, you know, so it's like it's usually the people that are on the front line that get the least amount of training on customer service and, and customer experience. And it's usually the highest level people that are going to all these workshops and the trainings and everything else. Right. So we, we, we really changed it. And 
So her position mission was to make people feel welcome. Yeah. Period. And so the more – so it was if someone came into the office and she would greet them or someone was on the phone, she had to make them feel welcome. And then she had to – you know, whatever she could do that they felt welcome. So part of feeling welcome was that it was not as if they were calling for the first time. So she would know that if Jeremy called our office, he was probably looking to talk to Jason because they're working on a project together. So she would, you know, hey, Jeremy, it's so great to hear from you again. Um, Jason's currently out of the office, but if you'd like, I can take a personal message and make sure he gets that note, or I can always put you in his voicemail if you'd prefer. Oh, my God. Right. Or if she knew that there was three people that were working on the project with you and that you normally call for Jason, she said, Jeremy, uh, I hope all's well. You know, Jason's actually not available right now. He's out at a meeting. But Steve and, Jer- and John are here, too. Would you like to speak to either of them? Right. Right. So it was about like, oh, you're important. I know who you are. I know who you're right. working with on our team. I want to make I had more people call me, email me, leave me voicemails telling me how amazing Susan was. Her name was Susan. And like. I mean, it was it was like right. it filled my heart with such happiness. It was such joy because like everyone would comment. Like, it was such a wow moment for them. And it wasn't like it wasn't like she was doing her job. Right. Most receptionists get trained on how to literally transfer a call, how to send a fax, how to, you know, how to right. do those kinds of things. Like she wanted to know how to use the phone system better because it would help her give a better experience for right. the rest of the team. Right. Um, she took it very seriously. And, you know, she she part of her thing was like she came to me and she said, look, I want to have fresh flowers on the front desk every day. I'm like, OK, <laughs> like, like it sets a different mood. She's like, it makes me feel different when I'm on the phone. That's and when people walk in, it feels differently, she's like, so I'd like to establish a budget for fresh cut flowers on the front desk every single day. And we found a vendor that would do that. And it wasn't that expensive. And uh, ultimately, it was a it was a thing that made her feel better. It empowered her to do her job better. And every time she and it was she loved sunflowers, so it was mostly sunflowers on the desk. And uh, but when she saw the sunflowers, it put her in the right mood, and right. she translated that to everybody else. So it was a good tool to do her job. Someone else might need a, a high power computer. She needed yeah. a, a a vase of flowers. So, yeah. you know, it's kind of cool. So, she felt open enough to just request things like that. You know, not just to, you know, it's I mean, an open yeah. environment for her to say something because. I mean, I would ask anybody on my team or I would I would hope anybody would ask someone on their team, like, what is it that you need? Right. What are all the things that you need to do your job? Like, what do you how can I help you? How can I empower you? How can I support you? How can I, you know, give you whatever you need to best do your job when our missions are like, like you know, there's a great quote from um, uh, Southwest Airlines from years and years ago, you know, and, uh, you know, it was talking with um, Herb, you know, Kelleher, the CEO of it. And. You know, someone, and I don't remember the exact quote, so I'll probably, I'll probably flood this up a little bit. But the, the 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 nature of the conversation was someone wanted to Im- improve meals uh, and provide some different meals for people on the planes because they thought it would be a better experience. And he said, "Our mission is we are the low cost airline. Right. And if the things don't align with that, then we're not doing them. Yes. And so the mission of being low cost are the meals going to make it that much better where we can't be the low cost airline? No, they're going to make us not be able to be that. Forget it." Find another way to engage with the customers and make them happy. Like that's not part of our value proposition. Right. Our value proposition, you know, there was that we wanted to create these amazing experiences and we want to lead by example because we're helping other people create examples, uh, experiences. So, so for us, like if it was something that would show our customers in some way or help us show our customers that yeah. we are going to deliver the absolute best experience possible, yes. then let's talk about it. And if it's not, if it's something that's going to distract from the experience or add more complexity to the experience, don't bring it to us because we're going to say no. It goes and back I think to the mission. Clear yeah. And it was very clear. We had a very clear mission, vision, values uh, for the for the organization. And we also had a lot of cool um, awards and recognitions and um, and all sorts of rituals. Like I think rituals are important both with customers and employees. And so we, you know, we would recognize um, everyone for contributions that they made. If, you know, we had a suggestion box. It sounds kind of cliche, but our suggestion box was probably w- worth millions of dollars to us, both in, in in additional revenues and in cost savings from things that people brought to the table that were amazing from different people throughout the company. And we would reward them for 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 providing suggestions and and giving us feedback. Mm. And, 
you know, uh, we had employees of the month, employees of the year, employees of the quarter. We had a big brother, big sister program also in our organization. So when we would bring on a new hire, they would get a big brother or big sister that would be their um, their person to help them become, you know, ingratiated into the culture and, yeah. and, and kind of become indoctrinated. And what was most gratifying for me in that was we had we had people like begging to become big brothers and big sisters. We had a line, a waiting list of people that wanted to be that because it was awesome to be able to to be a guide and be a you know a champion for someone new coming into the organization. So yeah, it was awesome. Talk about Jason. You know, it's interesting about there's an art and science to hiring, right, and training. And obviously, having you know hiring Susan, right? It did. Yes, she. Uh, you probably trained her well. Um, talk about the hiring process too, because you found the right fit, the right attitude to sit in that chair. Sure. Um, talk about some of the things that worked with the hiring process, and maybe some of the thing, mistakes you learned from. <laughs> okay, you have so none I, of those, I, but I've, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, our, our, I'll start with the mistakes because um, I just laugh. But you know, our we had a big logistics department, so we had to have equipment shipping out. We had crews of, of installation people arriving at the same time. We had just in time delivery. We had all sorts of things that were kind of moving. So we had a logistics department that would manage all that. Yeah. And as we were, we were growing pretty rapidly, like we were more than doubling in size. Like, you know, yeah. we were five like Xing, 10 Xing, like year over year and for a few years there, it was getting um, crazy. I mean, it was crazy. It was a fun ride, a lot of adrenaline, but a lot of mistakes. Um, and so our logistics department wasn't keeping up and we needed someone to come in that really could help us figure that out. And we went out and we searched for people, um, and we hired someone who had been like this, like senior manager person at FedEx. And we thought, Oh my God, this is the whole, right, as soon as you say FedEx, right? Like logistics. FedEx, like they get packages on time every day, bang, bang, bang. It's amazing. Right. And so we were so excited and, and super great person like you know no no not, not a bad person but what we learned very quickly was that people that operate the systems in fedex like they deal with exception handling right so they figure like when a package doesn't get there like a lot of their work is about you know dealing with stuff that didn't work in their system not actually making their system they're starting system was it a long time ago and it's been refined or whatever most of the the employees at, at various levels of management have nothing to do with how it actually works yeah. they deal with how to make things that kind of didn't work right get get better and tweak it yeah yeah exactly and and just deal with those exceptions this person literally had no clue how to set up a logistic system like had no idea and we ended up like it, it got way way worse like everything that got put in place was was put in place as if we were fedex dealing with a certain level of volume. it was all i can tell you is we probably it, that the hire itself probably cost us a half a million dollars wow and holy cow uh, yeah, between salaries and the hiring process and the termination process and, and all the mistakes that were made and, and, and then the morale issue in that department, we really we really made a big mistake. And so, you know, I think the, the lesson that I learned from that, I try and learn a lesson from all these, you know, huge – like that to me is like getting a Ph.D. education and then something. Like, you know, every time spend <laughs> more that than time. a Ph.D. Yeah. yeah, joke with my dad all the time. Like you paid for college, but I, I've actually paid for it more, more times over. Right. Um, so, so many mistakes. But what, what we learned is that – you know, the, the skills for people needed to create things are not necessarily the same skills as people like to operate. Like I said, when we started off, like I love to create things and put them in place, but I didn't like to operate them. So there's there's different people that you need. So at various stages of your business, I think what you're going to realize and what maybe most people on here do realize is the people that helped you start up a business are not necessarily the same people that are going to have the same skills yeah. later on. So I think you need to like look at the growth and the evolution of your business yeah. and, and hire for the both the stage you're in and where you're going in different places. And then you know, we were growing so quickly. We, we had a real, um, a real commitment to our team and to our people. They were a family. Like we, we got to be a good sized business, but we still treated it if it was a mom and pop and we, we all kind of hung out and knew each other and would bust each other's chops and have a good time. It was fun. It was, you know, it was like that kind of college environment, if you will, like in the dorms where everyone's having a really good time, but also getting stuff done. And what was interesting is, you know, we realized that we had to grow the team and the business, not just grow the business. Yeah. It's, we spent a lot of time on training and education and empowering people to, to, do, to go down roads and to pursue interests that they might have in, in different ways. And so, so that was like a really hardcore uh, learning for us. And like I said, it was expensive and it was 
time consuming and it was you know embarrassing with some of the problems we had with our clients you know we made a big deal with some of the clients that we had some challenges with saying look we're, we're hiring like someone from fedex like this is gonna be great and they're like oh that's awesome and then then it went even worse and we were like oh my god we just learned a lesson again and you know so i mean we had thank thank goodness we had some really deep relationships with our customers mm-hmm. and they 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 understood that we were our heart was in the right place we weren't we weren't not yeah. solving problems. you were maliciously there we you were right yeah we cared probably too much and we're trying to hit it out of the park. It's a so, balancing so act like, though. I mean, because yeah. if you're growing so fast, you need to hire people, but you want to hire the perfect quality person. How sure. did you manage that fast growth and even bringing on hires and training them while you're so, growing so fast? So one of the things that we did, we had, you know, we had an HR, uh, VP of HR, you know, um, and, uh, I, I don't think we actually called her VP of HR. I think it was like, you know, the VP of, you know, team culture cultivation or team cultivation or something at the time. But um, she was instrumental. She was very involved in the, the, and HR was not a place where you went to get reprimanded. HR was a place where you went for growth yeah. in our business. It was a way to grow. It was not a, it was not a pink slip place where you go in and you get called into HR. It was, you want to grow, you want to see your career. So she spent a lot of time talking to people about their career path and development and, and the employee journey. And what is their journey going to be like? Where do they want to be in three years? Where do they want to be mm-hmm. in three months? And, and we would do that. We also brought on a full-time training manager. So we had a person that was mm. a trainer who would work both on the customer experience training stuff for ourselves and helping us teach all of our people the latest, greatest stuff that we learned, right. but also working with all the department heads and building training programs for all their teams so that everyone was always getting trained. We had a, uh, a learning management system in the business, so everyone would get like certifications. and It was gamified, so everyone would have to up-level if they wanted to get you know, get to the next level in the business. They had to up level. They were competing against their peers in a fun way. So we made it fun, made training and, and growth fun. Um, anyone that wanted to um, grow, um, we would help them in various ways. You know, we had some stipends for, for outside of the business education and training programs and things. And, you know, we had some stuff that we'd bring inside. If they if they saw a need for something, they could become the champion for that. They would get a bonus, you know, when we implemented it. Um, so, you know, that was really key. We also used Colby. Um, I yeah. Don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, sure. K-O-N-G, if people aren't familiar with it, we use Colby for every single person in the organization. I don't remember what they are, but do you know your Colby score? I'm a four two nine four. Four two so, nine four. What is that? Yeah. So four is my fact finder. So a nine or a ten would be like you need every little bit of detail. A zero is like you want no detail. So I'm at the lower end of that. So I like I like the Reader's Digest version when you're giving me information. Like give me some bullets and don't right. give me a lot of stuff. Um, a two is your ability to work within systems. So it's your follow through. So I like to, I like to um, create systems. I don't like to necessarily operate systems like we talked about. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next number, my nine, is your quick start. So it's your level of improvisation, kind of seat of your pants. So I've got mm-hmm. a really high, uh, you know, quick start. And then your implementer. That's really is, high quick start. Yeah, it's pretty high. There's still a ten. I, I could be one more. I'm close. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, my coach Dan Sullivan is a ten. Um, for example, so um, there, you could you could definitely be higher on that scale. I'm and, seven and, six and, four three. That's my seven six four three. Four, three. Yeah, yeah. So you're 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 more of a strategic planner, probably is what they would call you. Um, so, but we we got training on that. Like we knew what they all meant, and everyone in the company knew. So if you're going to go interact with somebody else, for example, like if I was going to work with you, I know that you've got a longer fact finder. So instead of me just like throwing some information at you quickly and then going on to the next thing. I would actually spend a few extra minutes, as painful as it may be for me, to give you more <laughs> detail because then right. you could own it. You would go away and do it. So right. within an organization, it was it was invaluable. Right. Uh, so you know, uh, it's it's really good. And the last number, just just to close the loop on that, yeah. the implementer. It's the the ability to kind of think abstractly about things. So someone that's got a high number like needs like a very detailed diagram and then you know the other person can kind of talk conceptually and have like a like a rough picture schematic right so when you start to know that about people it improves communication it does yeah they say that if you're more than four apart from another person you have an opportunity for conflict so like you know you're you're a seven seven um, six four four, three so we're close right on three on the implementer we're probably going to butt heads a little bit so knowing that we can manage it right it's it's just the way to to understand that right right? very interesting yeah, so it was really helpful. Uh, so on the logistics side, that was a hard lesson. What yeah. has been some of the most important best hires that you made? Uh, well, um, 
the training manager was one of the best hires we ever made. Um, just that um, his name was Bill, um, and he was because most uh, people I would they don't have a training manager typically, right? That's, that's I mean, the, we were probably at we were probably at fifty or sixty people when we brought on the training manager, yeah. and again we were growing so quickly, like we had to grow our people, and it was a it was a, a level of commitment to growth and excellence in our organization that we did that. Yeah. And, um, you know, that was important. We also had a process manager that, w- that worked for us full time who was, um, six Sigma trained in process and, hmm. you know, was a, I think was a black belt if I recall. And she was instrumental in helping. Cause again, if the whole thing for our customers is to engineer the whole journey and the throughput, we wanted to have as little complexity as we needed in every right. part to be more efficient. And we would actually use that, you know, like she would be on project teams working through stuff for our clients too. It wasn't just all internal. Right. So some of these were internal, like our training manager would help us put together trainings for our clients externally also. So they were billable resources as well as, you know, kind of um, expenses as well. So they were both sides of that. And they were awesome because then they also understood our business better. They bring stuff, amazing ideas back. So I think those are really important. Um, you know, the other the other kind of best hire I ever did in my life was uh, COO um, when I was COO. And I had the good fortune of bringing on uh, my best friend who we had been mm-hmm. friends for five or six years old. And uh, he, he works with me still in CX Formula now. Um, was and- that Did you find that risky at all or bringing on one of your best friends – in business, were there any disadvantages to that? Um, I'm sure there are. Uh, I we had very clear rules of engagement. Yeah. Like, like if we we could chew each other's head off inside, and we walk outside, we'll go have a beer. Right. Uh, we really were very good about that, and right. still to stay are. Um, we've only really had one instance, like early on in our lives, like way before this business, where we didn't talk for any period of time, and it wasn't, you know, you know, it wasn't like that, but. You know, we're, we 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 can finish each other's sentences, yeah. which is helpful. Um, and we've each got we've got a good amount of overlap too. So, you know, he's he's visionary as well. Um, he's a leader. He's a phenomenal human being. You know, and he's just a good person. And and we give you the shirt off his back. And I think, you know, he 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 builds trust within teams, and and people want to do well for him. Yeah. Um, and so so like for him to be kind of running the ship and manning the ship like for me i like if he told me something i didn't have to question it i knew it he would he would you know we, we didn't always see eye to eye on everything we would have disagreements about certain things right. but then we would decide we would just agree we're going to go with this way or that way and you know it was it was amazing you know and and still is so um so that's that's tremendous for me um at the same time um he cares like so it's 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 bringing in someone who really cares and he also was happy to defer to me as a ceo when need be you know and and i respected that so i didn't abuse that in any way i I don't think i mean maybe he would say i did but i don't think i did um you know i don't think that i i i have a i mean i had a tremendous amount of respect for all my team members so you know we we didn't have people on the team for the most part that weren't great and if we hired people we made plenty of mishires you know listen it's uh you know and and i think that it's incumbent upon people that you hire to also see if it's a good fit. And when it's not, you know, speak up. You know, one of the things we'd say to everyone on the, on the interview or on the hiring interview when we would actually offer them jobs, say, listen, you know, there's going to come a time when things are not going as we planned. And we don't want to feel bad about talking to you about it. So we're going to say to you, hey, remember when we hired you and we said, hey, something may go wrong sometime when we want to feel good about talking to you about it, not not – you know, be afraid to discuss it. Right. This is one of those times. And we want you to do the same thing. Like if you're not happy or you're feeling like it's not a good fit or you're feeling like you're not getting a fair shake or something mm-hmm. like that, we want you to come to us and say, hey, listen, like here's a problem. Yeah. Like it doesn't do us any good to not have a really functional relationship right. uh, and a really communicative. Yeah, so you set that right in the beginning. From day you set one. that precedent day one. in the beginning. Yeah. And we also like we were very – like we're not – we're, we're – I wouldn't say we're slow to hire, quick to fire, so to speak. Like I think you should be slower to hire and, and really find the right people. But I will say that we were quick to communicate about things as they were happening, and we make small corrections. Like we try not to let something get to a complete boiling point before, right. um, and it's like, oh, what do you mean? I had no idea, right? I'd rather, you know, um, I'd rather work with people on a regular basis and and share with them, you know, where we're at, where they're at, get a pulse check. And one of the best things about a new hire coming in is they have they have a visibility into things in your business that 
people that have been there for a while don't. They have blinders on. They've been there so long. They don't they don't see things the same way. So so we would also sit down every week or every other week with a new person and say, what do you think is like the biggest thing you'd change? Mm. Like based on it's a the, tough conversation to have too from an ego perspective. Why? I mean, if if you want your business to get better, yeah, I you, agree. But I sometimes mean, we like, ask that, and sometimes we just wanted to hear everything's good. You know. I mean, so what were some of the things people said? I mean, we would get all sorts of comments, you know, on, on different things. Like one of the things that um, like I hired an assistant at one point and she said to me, I need more time with you. Like you don't give me enough time. I don't know how I could ever be successful. And she was right. I mean, yeah, I didn't give her enough time. And you know, so like, like things like that, like I would hate to find out six months later then I'm like mad because all this stuff's not getting done. And she's like, I never understood what to do and blah, blah, blah. So like, you know, you could have all sorts of situations, like even something as simple as that to, you know, we had people come in saying, oh, um, you know, I think it's ridiculous that you guys ship these products out before they're configured. And we'd be like, what are you talking about? They're like, well, you're shipping these things out and, and they're not configured. So when a, so when they get onto a job site, one of our techs has to go out there and configure them. It takes like an extra seven hours on site mm. where it could get done in 10 minutes in the office. Wow. And, and our people would be like, what? And so we go back and we look through and there was like some check and balance that wasn't set right. And that saved us like tens of thousands of dollars from some new employee coming in and saying that seemed really dumb. Right. So, I mean, for me, like God bless them. Like I love when people, for sure. Us that site. You know, one of the, one of the books that I love, uh, or I haven't read it in a while, but you know, good to great by Jim Collins. I'm sure, you know, you've read it and other people have as well. It's like confront the brutal facts, right? right? You gotta confront the brutal facts. Like if we were going to grow, one of the things that we learned early on is and we did a lot of rollouts like we talked about earlier. So you'd figure it out and then you'd roll out a hundred of them or a thousand of them. If you have a mistake, it's times a thousand. Multiply, yeah. So you have to be quick at looking at what's going on and confronting those brutal facts. The faster your business is growing, the the more diligent you have to be and the more open I think you need to be to confronting those brutal facts. And I think you need to be open to it no matter what. But if you are growing faster and you're adding more clients, like let's say that you have a bad experience for a client when they first come on, right? So I sign up to come to your, your chiropractic office and, and the scheduling is a mess and it's, it's just not right. And then now all of a sudden you do a, a radio spot and 30 people come and they sign up. Now you got 30 people, right? right? It's just, it's just like, you don't want to have that mistake amplify that way. So you have to have a mechanism. And, and one of the things that we talk about in, in the CX formula program like is that backstage side, like how do you not have those kind of errors? Because the more successful you are, the more those errors are going to show up and the more expensive they're going to be to fix and the more costly and time, you know, time intensive they're going to be to, to undo some of those things. Yeah. So, so to me, it's like, even if you have a business with one person, it's just you and you've got like four clients, like, great. If you don't have a business at all, you're thinking about starting one. Great. You got to start thinking about this stuff now because it'll save so much time. I mean, We've learned this the hard way, you know, by, you know, dealing with fallout and dealing with problems right. and like learn from my five hundred thousand dollar mistake or whatever the mistake is. Don't make that, it yourself. I wish it was. Yeah, but but that's that's the reality, right? You got to make sure that you don't magnify and multiply these problems. And then when you find the right formula, now you want to scale it. And so we're really, you know, we're interested in helping people figure that out, get it to that point where they have that formula. And then helping them scale it and analyze it, and, and it, it's a it's a process like this. You're never done, right? You're never done. It it it, it has to. You have to keep tweaking it, and then you get to the next level, and now you got to look at it again and, and again and again. And it, it gets more fun though, because it's it's a game. You know, you're playing a game to win. It's just, you have a strategy, and now you're looking at how your strategy's going, and now you're tweaking it. And to me, like it's one of the most fun things you could possibly do. Yeah, I mean, even one of these things that people take it is invaluable right if you just ask someone your staff like what would you change or new person or old person or just going back to your business and asking that one question could if we haven't asked it could release some just huge you know hugely valuable information on the business um, yeah i mean you could also ask you know what's the number one thing that frustrates you in your job right now like, yeah. what do you think is like really frustrating or what is one thing that you feel like you're doing um, over and over and over again that if we could automate it would save us tons of time and money yeah. Right. Or, you know, whatever those things are like, there's, there's like, I think those, there's those, you know, thought provoking questions that someone may not even be aware of it. Right. They could be just, you know, going through the motions every day. We had what, this is a dumbest little example, but in our customer service department, we had, you know, we probably had like 15, 20 people that worked in that department. 
And every time like a, a service ticket got done, it would get printed out, copied three times, put in a binder here, here, and here. And so like it was just it was from the early, early days when I don't know, it just happened and, and everyone got trained that that's what to do. And we started looking at our toner consumption on our copier because we started getting more and more and we couldn't figure out like where's all the toner going? It came from an, our, our CFO looking at the office supply budget. Right. And then we started we back in we back in, you know, and reverse engineered the whole thing. And we found out that it was the customer service people that were making a four billion photocopies. <laughs> and it was all for a process that everyone hated. Everyone was annoyed that they had to go do this. They had to go because they have to walk to this department, that department. Accounting got one. Engineering got one. Customer service got one. Right. So there was these three copies of this and they had to go around. They had to put them in the book. They had to put them in the right spot. We had to buy more binders. I mean, like it was it was an insane process. And so we found this out. And so we, we said to them, has anyone ever looked in these books? The only time they ever got open was to add more stuff to them. Like they never got open. And then we were storing them. We had offsite storage for all these binders too. Because each year we'd have like 40 boxes go to offsite storage wow. for no reason. We just stopped it. Now and all every, of us have that stuff. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. It's one of the things that we talk about is if there's stuff that happens backstage that doesn't support that front stage client right. experience, you got to get rid of it. There's no reason for it. And you'll find that it, it frustrates your employees. Right. It adds more cost to the process. Like so, so just kind of going through this and looking at it, we look at everything through that customer lens, though, yeah. and then we make sure that everything behind the scenes supports that that experience. So, it's just you would. I've always been blown away by all the the littlest things. Like you don't realize, like I'm, we're making a million photocopies for no reason, right? You know? So every business has got those kinds of things and you know it's helpful to have again a framework to look how do i even look at this like where do i even find where these things are how do i how do i handle that so and jason we'll link up at the end um but you have a free book and it's called seven mistakes what's the the yeah so it's a, it's, I, I wouldn't call it a full book per se but it's a, it's a cool pdf download that has what i call them the seven customer killers that are yeah. destroying your bottom line and it gives you some like common common mistakes that businesses make without realizing it and um and then some strategies or some yeah. tactics actually of how to avoid those but inside that also i have a download for what i call the customer persona creator tool and that is the way that i use that you know that magic if statement that's how i help you figure out how much more there is to know about each of your customers so you gotta i mean take me up on that like grab that because it's just uh, i mean it's it's transformational for your business just going through that thinking it's a thinking tool it's a way to think right. through more information it asks you some good questions it's a wizard and when you answer it you get this one page report it's pretty pretty good looking report but it explains your customer in a, in a way that just helps you um create more value for them yeah so where can people go and find that just so i don't forget and i'm gonna write it down Shh. Yeah, no problem. It's at go.cxformula.com forward slash inspired insider. Got one word. And then yeah. can you share one of those killer – what's one of those uh, killer mistakes that people should so, not be making? So one of the things that people do is they like to over-promise or over-deliver, under-promise and over-deliver. So they think that over-delivery is a way to wow your customers. And, and it, it will wow your customers at some point. But there's a lot of research on this. And, and the, the, the thing that's so interesting about it to me is just doing what you say is worth more to a customer than doing more than you say. Like that extra that you do doesn't get the same value in the customer's mind. And so we spend all this energy to over deliver and we try and do it a lot. And so the customer doesn't have as much perceived value of that as if you just do what you say, number yeah. one. Number two, if you're always over delivering, it's not over delivering anymore because the expectation from the customer is that over delivery. So now it's just normal. And so the bar, it's like this logarithmic equation of what you have to keep doing to keep over delivering. And it becomes impossible from a resource standpoint, financially, time, energy, creativity. Like you said, like what else can we do to one up ourselves? So what I do is I give you a strategy of how to use it uh, strategically. How do you over deliver sometimes and how do you just meet expectations mm -hmm. and how do you make sure that your client's expectations are being met. Like, how do you help set those client expectations? So that's like an example of one of the killers in there. And um, it's it's just so important to, to look at those things and, and to think about them. And you realize probably tons of savings just in the operational time and the energy and even stuff you might buy or purchase and procure in your business. When um, did you discover that one? Uh, early on, early on. I mean, because we, you know, we would always try and wow our customers. And so, you know, I, 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 I did a whole 
I do a whole thing on wow, and I call it the anatomy of wow, and I define wow as surprise of an elevated magnitude. So wow can be a positive equation, like wow, that's awesome. Wow can also be a negative equation. Wow, that sucked. Right, right. right. So both directions. Yeah. And so if you want to, and, and wow is primal. It's um, it it it's a pure gut reaction. There's no thinking. It's it's a reaction that you have to something. And so people want to have a lot of wow in their business, and and that's great to have wow. But what happens, and we did this early on, we would we would we would blow all of our resources on this big wow. And a lot of businesses do that. They grand opening of a new facility, and they 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 all beautiful whatever. But now what's left after that? Like there's there's it's all downhill, right? Yeah. There's nothing else to to do that. What I found is, and I and I call this the one percent approach. I have this idea called the one percent approach, and the idea behind it is, I can give you a hundred percent better. That's fine. I use a dollar bill. So if I give you a dollar bill, that's let's call that a hundred percent, right? A hundred cents. Well, I can give you that, and I've got nothing else to give you. I could give you four quarters. It's still a hundred percent, right? So I give you a quarter this week. I wait a couple weeks to give you another quarter. I wait a couple weeks to give you another quarter. You get the picture, right? Yeah. So you still get that hundred percent, but now I broke it out. You could do it with dimes. You get ten. I could do it with nickels. You get twenty. I could do it with pennies. You get a hundred. But what happens if you do it that linearly is you still create an expectation that every week for the next 100 weeks I'm going to get a penny. So what I like you to do is I like you to take a quarter this week and then do a nickel. And then you do a dime. And then you do another nickel. And then you do three pennies. And then you do a quarter. And now all of a sudden you've got this dynamic range. It's like a symphony. It's like if the music score for a symphony was always the same volume level, the same tempo, it wouldn't be interesting. But when it has, it gets faster and slower and louder and softer, that's where it becomes exciting. People love that. That's where the roller coaster fun, the, the amusement park fun comes from. So when you think about dripping your content or engaging your customers, if you use that 1% approach, you will wow your customers, but you won't set this unreasonable, unmanageable, unattainable expectation that will happen forever. So those are the kinds of strategies that I give in this book. It's, it's really helpful, I think. Uh, I know. I mean, I've seen it work for thousands of customers and, and, and my own business as well. So really important to, to, to think about the strategy of how am I going to continue to engage my, my, my customers and not, you know, not get to a point where I can't deliver value because I've, I've, I've shot all of the value that I have. I've got nothing else to give. Yeah, Jay. So you change it up with the customer. And uh, so talk about fast forward a little bit. So creative realities. Um, you had a very successful exit of the company. Um, yep. What are some of the things people should look out for on that front that you learned? Um, so I think one of the, well, I think one of the most important things when you're exiting a business is the mental preparation for exiting a business. Um, so I stayed on for a while and then, then I had left and after I had kind of lost my baby that I created from scratch and I had sold it and I had left, I was in a, I had a period of two years of complete paralysis. Um, I had a couple other businesses that I had started that I owned and I was dealing with, but I, I felt bad. Like I, I wasn't prepared for that. And, uh, um, yeah, yeah. And I, and I, I've talked to at least a dozen, if not more other entrepreneurs that have been through an exit that have had similar stories. And, you know, it's not about making more money or, or anything. It's about contribution. It's about feeling like you're contributing in some way and, and not sure where to go. And, and it's been, it was a very dark time, um, really personally. It's really surprising for people to hear, right? I was shocked myself, like yeah. going through it. Like I, 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 it's like I had, I had means, I had accomplishments, I had, you know, a certain level of success that I was proud of in my life. And yet I felt empty and, and lost. Um, and it was hard. It was a hard thing. So I think there's a, a lot of mental preparation. Now, other people that have started another business while they're exiting or whatever, uh, I haven't seen the same kind of um, experience. So that might be a strategy. I don't know. But for me and, and a few other people that I've talked to, um, even recently in the last couple of weeks, um, it's a thing. Like it's a thing that happens to a bunch right. of people. Um, and nobody nobody warned me for that one. So I think that was that was tough. And like I said, it was it was two years tough. Um, before I even kind of got out of that. Wow. Yeah, it was it was hard. So I think that that's important. Like you got to be ready. And and there's all sorts of other like little things. Like you find yourself at home, and now you're like you know you're you're picking up stuff around the house, and you're 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 doing things that you weren't used to doing. And and you feel like there's a there's a 
not that that's not good stuff to do or important. It's just or, a disconnect you know, from what you're used to. What I was used to doing, yeah. yeah. And, you know, just feeling very lost. So, so was, was there some euphoria at the end? Like some excitement? I mean... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell me I'm about... Some, after. Yeah, so, but, so yeah. T- tell me about the the uh, fun part. What do you do to celebrate something like that? I mean, you work... You how many years did you have the business? Buy a Ferrari. What do you, what do, you, what do, you do? <laughs> <laughs> I started the business in, uh, in 97. So yeah. I had it for... Yeah, I, and I sold in uh, 08 and then stayed on for another two years. So... Yeah. You know, it was uh, 11, 12 years, you know, and uh, it was a, it was a, it was a ride, you know, but it was everything. Like I, I was, I was a young kid, you know, and I, I made every mistake in the book with the business in the beginning. And I, it started with me in my living room. I bought a copier off of, um, it was like a, a, a want ad at the time, like the newspapers, right? It was like a classified ad. I thought, okay, I got a business. I need a copier. And I bought a copier. And I, you know what I mean? Like I was like doing dumb things. I went to Staples and I bought all these office supplies. And like, you know, I was like, I was just like, it was like Making fun. it official. Yeah. yeah, it was like, it was like official, right? I had letterhead made, you know, and uh, got some business cards. And so I went from that point to, you know, I got the first gig and I needed people. And then I hired like 20 people and, you know, we were, we were off to the races. And so, and, and, and from that moment, forward like my life changed forever and I, I never really looked back on it it was just going and then and then it stopped when I left that business so it was like high energy and we were hyper growth you know and we had plenty of ups and downs we we had we hit rock bottom we had we had sales issues like we were we would sell we get a lot of client work and then we'd be delivering it and I didn't have a sales process and so once we'd finished delivery I had all these people and I had no revenue I was like Oh my God, what do I do now? And then it was like, okay, so we were like porpoising for a while until we figured it out. And, you know, we, we did a lot of great things. I mean, I was in a group, uh, the Young Entrepreneurs Organization, or EO now. Um, I was in a group called the CEO Clubs. I joined uh, YPO for a while. Um, I, you know, I was in uh, Dan Sullivan's Strategic Coach, uh, joined early on and was in that for years. So it was like uh, learning all of this. Yeah. It was about being a student. Being amongst peers so that you can trade, you know, whatever highs and lows and mistakes and things that they should, you know, best practices type of thing. And not feel so alone, right? Yeah. Like, you know, I, I have a mastermind um, that I run and, you know, I, I run a, I run a mastermind for us, people that are in like the early stages of their business because I feel like that's when I needed the most help and there wasn't yeah. a lot of experienced people for that. So I have yeah. a, a group that I run and it's, a, it's about not feeling so alone and so lost and yeah. having people that are in the same kinds of things as you are and, and, and going through it together. So, so that was invaluable, you know, and, uh, but the euphoria, there was a lot of it, you know, and I was excited. And like I said, I, I, I did, I bought a Ferrari and, Oh, you said, you weren't joking. Yeah, you really bought a Ferrari. I really, I, yeah. I really bought a Ferrari. <laughs> like, um, uh, I think I bought it right before I saw, I mean, you know, it was doing, the business was doing well, but I bought it like at that point, like that was like my, my milestone, um, to buy it. I had always told myself, I play games with myself. So I don't know if you do it, you know, as well. I know a lot of entrepreneurs, like we got to motivate ourselves in some way. So I, I reward myself with different things, right? Yeah. I create little, little games yeah. for myself to play mentally uh, a lot. So I, I, that was one of my games. Like, so what know, was I, another reward? So Ferrari was one. What was another reward? Uh, you... What well, we did like on, on a personal level, like, so like um, earlier than that, you know, I wanted to do this thing called the SLR challenge. It was, um, the McLaren Mercedes SLR car. They had a thing where you could go down to Homestead Speedway in Miami and you could race their car on the track. And it's like that was a milestone that I want to do. Um, you know, th- things like that. I always kind of came up with some kind You're of. You're a car person. Thing. I'm I'm a bit of a car person. Yeah, yeah. I had a few businesses in, in the automotive, uh, auto sports kind of arena. So you know, it was those kinds of things. You know, we I did a thing where you know took my whole family away on a on this ridiculous vacation, like my extended family and whatever too was like a game, uh, one of the prizes for my, one of my games, you know, some of it might just be that I get to, uh, you know, I blow off a, a day of work one day, like not that I can't do that anyway, but I, 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 I set little goals for yeah. myself. And I work until you something. achieve that goal. Then you can't, yeah, do it. I won't, I won't take a day off until I do that or something, you know? So, um, I just like to gamify things for me and, and for my team and for my customers too. I just think it's, it's just, it's motivating. We're all kind of competitive yeah. in our, in our, beings you know so so i i use that as a way to just drive and motivate myself because yeah. otherwise i'd be a couch potato i'd be sitting on the couch watching tv or something so. you know so jason obviously we've talked a lot about creative realities right but you have four other businesses yeah right with the medical diagnostics automotive spirits and digital media which one would be important to talk about obviously i knew beforehand that we could probably talk for five hours straight and still not cover everything <laughs> so 
But I at least want to touch about on one of the other businesses because it's really interesting how you've spanned different, you know, types of businesses. Sure. What, will be, what, what to you is the most interesting out of those four? Maybe there's stories from two of them that would be uh, interesting to hear. Yeah, I'll give you two different ones, like, yeah. like quick, quick versions of it. Yeah. So the, the medical diagnostics one, um, so we, we taught people, or taught people, we tested people for um, sleep apnea, narcolepsy, restless leg syndrome. So it was a sleep diagnostic center. And it was um, created with a partner. Um, and um, it was something that, you know, we saw the opportunity in the world uh, that sleep, it was like 80 million diagnosed cases of it. And, you know, you know, from the medical side, I, I know nothing. I am not a doctor. I don't play one on TV or anything. <laughs> Uh, but but you are so you probably I'm know more give you about a lab it. coat and then you can play one on TV. Yeah, exactly. I'll do the <laughs> magic if. But um, but in any event, what what we wanted to do is we wanted to help solve that, and we 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 got involved with a few other people that were doing this, and um, we created some centers. And the idea was, how do you create a center that's not a hospital that doesn't have like one bed that's not all this bureaucracy that we can just serve and support patients? So it was a it was a true patient care model versus like a medical model. Yeah. So we, we were, um, we would hire on doctors. We had a, a, a cardiologist and a neurologist that would be our medical directors for each center. Yeah. We had, um, you know, sleep tax or, you know, polysomnographers um, that would work in the different centers. We had a head tech and then multiple techs underneath them. And, you know, it was about having the client experience be right. So we'd have 12 bed centers um, and we, uh, we would guarantee patients that they could be seen within 24 to 48 hours. So like hospitals, they could be waiting for six to eight weeks and whatever. Right. What was so interesting was, you know, the model was about you know, referrals from doctors. And so we had to have docs refer them. And, and at the time, like we were finding out a lot of docs didn't really know a whole lot about sleep, diagnose, uh, sleep, uh, apnea and, right. and some of those challenges and stuff. So we had two, two legs of our campaign. Yeah. We would go out, we would you educate, educate them. Yeah, we'd go out and educate doctors and teach them and whatever. And then we would create an experience for the doctors that they would want to refer to us more so than anybody else. And so, you know, we had sales reps that would go out like, you know, like normal pharma kind of rep model where they would right. go out and they would do them. We would invite them to do lunch and learns or, or evening wine and cheese things Sushi where we'd learns. invite a bunch of doctors. Um, yeah. To, uh, well, so literally. what's the timeline of this? Are you running? Are you fully running the other business too, or where does this fall in? We started this in two thousand and six or seven. Okay, so, so you're I was, running two different businesses. Yeah, so I was. So I had a partner that was the the operator, right. and I was the marketer. Right. So I dealt with uh, with marketing strategy and and right. what have you, and and the client experience, obviously, right. So we dealt with it's all the build out stuff yeah. that went in there. And we dealt with the marketing. He dealt with the operations. Yeah. The center. It's interesting because there's a big company or a growing company in Chicago, Context Media, that sort of does that for doctor's office. I don't know the in and out of it, but like sort of. I've done, yeah, I've done a lot of doctor's offices now, and I, I can really help docs make a lot more money. Yeah. Um, because, you know, it's 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 – you have to think about it from a different perspective, like yeah. not from the insurance company. And what we, so most of our patients were insurance, you know, so, you know, but, but we knew that the, the certain volume that we had to do to, that it would work. Right. And so I think, you know, especially now with, with doctors that are charging direct to patients or have concierge plans or other right. kinds of things, there's a lot of ways to add value to the clients that where you can make it work. And, Clients need to feel like they are in charge, even if the insurance company's paying. Like they need to be the customer, and it needs to change. And the care part of it has to get back into the equation. I mean, I talk to doctors all the time. Like, why did you get into this? It's like I want to help people. I want to make them feel better. But they don't do it all the time now because there's the bureaucracy that gets in the way. So how do we help you turn turn your practice into a way that it's client focused and still profitable and even right. more profitable? So we were super profitable. Like we made plenty of money. And we also gave away free treatments all the time because we had to, because people needed them and they couldn't. And they couldn't afford we just it. Yeah. Into the model. We just built into the model. Like it, you know, it's like business people running a doctor's office. Like there are there are business people that happen to be doctors. Then there's also doctors that don't have a lot of the business experience. So we can help them with that a lot of times, and they can then do more of what they yeah. why they got into the business in the first place. So what was so, a big lesson from the uh, medical diagnostic side, setting up the clinics and, and working in that business? Um, well, other I, my big learning is I don't like regulated businesses personally. It's not my thing, but I love helping 
those businesses. But it's not like I didn't like being a regulated business. It was frustrating. They were like we had to move like a sink seven times before we opened up one of the sensors because they different like inspectors came through and they like they gave us like this like argument about the height of the sink or the left and right location of the sink or the the size of the bowl of the sink. Like each time it was a different thing. It was like the same, you know, like that kind of stuff. It was just like nonsense to me. Like I couldn't believe it. Like, you know, we had a plumber, like we literally like could have become a plumber and, and, and made a fortune off of ourselves. You know what I mean? Right. It's, it's crazy. But, you know, like things like that were frustrating. But what I loved was like the, 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 the patients left. We had so many rave reviews from patients. And like we, we know that we made a difference and we helped people live a better life. Like there were people that could have had a heart condition that like were getting the help that they needed. Right. And, and then what we also, again, because we didn't think of it as we were just a diagnostic center. That's how we made our money. We didn't make money after the test. But we made money after the test by referrals because we helped patients focus on compliance, like using the, the different um, CPAP right. machines or whatever. Because most people that go through the test, they find out what it is, and then they don't remain compliant. I'm right. sure that happens. They don't most. follow through with it, yeah. They don't follow through. So we decided that we were going to be in the patient care business. And even though we didn't get paid for that, we were going to help people follow through. And we were going to create seminars and webinars and, and gatherings and get-togethers and you know, we would literally hold people's hands through it. We would bring in, we do free masks, but we give away new free masks and stuff that we would pay for to get people in to find like the latest, greatest, make sure it was comfortable for them, what they were doing with their masks and things like that. And it was huge. And the, the gratitude, again, that, you know, to me, like when you're able to make that kind of an impact for your customers, when they really, when they, when they want to come tell you, thank you, like if they want to come to your office and thank you, you know you're doing something right. right. You know it's not all about the dollars in the sense. Like you, you'll make money because you're doing things right. right. So, right. so for me, you know, it was really awesome. And like we did like little things. Like one of the things that we would do when they would come in is we would the 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 person that would bring them in was um, the patient care coordinator, and they would bring them in. They'd get them situated in their room. And we had all sorts of stuff. Like we had DVDs. Like you know, we were like a, a Netflix like location. We could all this kind of stuff. We had laptops they could use, iPads, like, you know, whatever. We had a coffee menu in the morning. Like, we'd have all sorts of different coffees and lattes and whatever for breakfast for them and all this kind of stuff. So it was like Four Seasons-esque, right, from that right. experience. But the, 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 the one thing that we would say to everyone, which which we got more mileage out of than anything else, and we would really do this, is we would ask them, listen, we know that you're going to probably be going right to work in the morning. You've got your stuff here. Um, could we press your clothes for you while you are getting studied this evening? They're like, What? Like yeah, yeah. Can we press your clothes? Like, can we can we iron your clothes for you and and make sure that you're you know you're ship in ship shape in the morning? You'd be like, no, but thank you. Oh my god, right? <laughs> and and literally, we had two ironing boards and two irons in the kitchen. Like, and they would have we we made sure everyone knew how to iron, you know. But like <laughs> that's part of the job description. I don't think yeah. I don't think anyone ever took us up on the ironing, but everyone told everyone else that we offered to iron their clothes because what that's doctor's great. office or hospital offers to iron your clothes? So it, it's like knowing that they're in this place or away from home. They're like they're just told by the doctor that they're probably going to have a heart condition because of this. If they don't get it checked right away, and they're coming right. in and they get wires and, you know, leads connected to themselves. They, they feel disgusting. They know someone's like got a camera staring at them all night and watching them sleep. Like it's an invasive weird. For sure it is. Yeah. We're doing everything in our power to make them feel like we love them and we care about them because we do. We want them to get better. Right. And um. And we made it as great an experience as we could. And I'm telling you, like the the, the feedback and the responses, and uh, uh, it was just it was amazing. And so so to be part of that for me was awesome. Yeah, um, I really I loved that from that perspective. Yeah. Uh, um, so so awesome. which are the other ones you want to talk so, about? You know, one of the other ones I would mention is is Drive Safer, and uh, we just sold that not too Drive long. Drive Safer. What, what did you? What was that business? So that is a, um, a business that focused on how to prevent the number one killer of teens in the U.S., which is motor vehicle crashes. So most most deaths of people between the ages of 15 and 21 are from motor vehicle mm, crashes. That's crazy. And, and they're, it is crazy. Like, I had no idea, so right? And, and most parents have no idea. Parents who have 16-year-old kids have no idea that that is the most dangerous thing they could possibly do while they're a teenager is to drive a car or be in a car with another teen that's a driver. And the statistics are just staggering, mm. you know. And so, you know, being a guy that likes to go to the track and, and what have you, we learn right. very quickly how bad a driver you are until you get the training. Like, you don't really know mm. until you put your car in situations where it's going to go out of control and learn how to avoid that and, and handle that maneuver. It's counterintuitive. You don't, 
it is counterintuitive. It's very counterintuitive. And we also all get a little bit of ego about it because we think we're better at it than we really are. And you got a 4,000 pound weapon and you could kill yourself. Right. And so we, we found out very quickly that this is a, an epidemic and being that we had some uh, excitement and interest and passion around this. And we had an uncompete where I couldn't do the customer experience stuff still. It was a fun business to go into because we were saving lives and helping people. And so we created a program. Uh, the other thing I didn't mention is that the, the, the way that kids crash is they go out of control. They're usually single car crashes where the driver was inexperienced. Mm -hmm. So that's the main cause. So, um, you know, you can add in texting and driving and all these other things, but that's all. It makes it 10 times worse. Yeah. It does. It does. You know, so, um, so we put them through an experiential learning model where we would rent out huge stadium, like football stadium parking lots. We create all these different levels of courses where they would go. I kind of look at it like the karate kid, like wax on, wax off. So we put them through these like fundamental drills. They wouldn't really understand why they're doing them. I mean, we'd right. explain it, but once like, they paint this, fence. this whole yeah. thing, exactly. By the end, they're like, hi, yeah, I can do it, you know? So, uh, so it's pretty cool. And, uh, like we had people like writing into us constantly, like, oh my God, my kid was just in a, in a, uh, situation where they probably would have been killed, but they, 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 they wow. survived because of this. Um, and just, uh, it was fun. It was engaging. We were helping a lot of people. Um, making making some money. How did you decide even what to create? So like, okay, you're just like, I want to save kids' lives with this. I mean, you could have put them in a classroom. I mean, so people would show up and they would be put through these courses. They'd show up. We'd have a tent, which was a classroom. They'd do an hour of classroom training and then they would do five hours of behind the wheel exercises and situations and and driving. It'd be driving into so different regions or what regions did you we did you... this so we did it throughout uh new york new jersey pennsylvania kind of wow. northeast corridor and then um uh we're able to kind of give the model to some other people that wanted to take it to the next level yeah um and uh it's just awesome i mean it's a lot of fun we spent a lot of time um speaking at uh, high schools colleges universities really? uh, um you know uh different community organizations yeah. and and spreading the word and creating more awareness about it and uh and definitely made an impact um and you know for me it was it's again like i see i have kids you know and seeing like my i have a six-year-old now who started driving like little carts like like little power wheels cars and now he does like electric carts and stuff and seeing he's been doing it since he was like one and a half two years old and go you because know, his brother had him who's a little bit older and 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 you know i love that kind of fun stuff and what have you i got them both like a little ferrari that matched my <laughs> but um but i saw yeah. that he had a different level of hand-eye coordination and dexterity around it just from two you look at some of the people that are professional race car drivers they've been doing go-karts and stuff since they were four or five years old right you know, ten thousand hours of practice to become an expert at something why not start them off learning how to deal with some of that stuff earlier so that they yeah. really understand it so once I had kids and I started seeing this problem and I was, you know, involved in the motorsports arena with my partner, Drew, as, as well, my my COO, he, we did this one together as well. Um, it was like, we got to do this. We got to help people. Yeah. This is awesome. And we didn't invent the model of how we did it. I mean, if you look at other countries, like mostly in Europe and, and other parts of the world where they have more snow and other kind of weather, it is mandatory. Like to get a license, you have to show that you can drive on ice and avoid skids and slides and whatever. It's only in the U.S. that we don't do that stuff. Yeah. So we literally took the kinds of training that they do in other parts of the world and brought it here. We didn't invent this. Right. We just we just created a system and a model yeah. to be able to do it and uh, and took the initiative to go do it. Yeah. Fantastic, amazing, Jason. What you, what you can do in 24 hours? Well, you know, it's you got you got, you got seven days, right? You got to keep going. So last questions. Um, you know, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask, um, what's been the lowest point? And how you push through, and then what's been the proudest moment? What's been the lowest point, and how you push through? Uh, lowest point, um, just kind of in life in general. I, I think I I shared a little bit of that with you already, like the the selling of the business and not knowing where to go and not knowing what my purpose was and feeling like, you know, is this all there is? Like, you know, did I I, I got a bunch of money and I. I grew a business and I had lots of employees and I exit like what's next and, 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 and having no clue and, and not having a big enough vision, I think, um, was perhaps the lowest. And I think the answer was, um, 
coaching. I, you know, was going to the strategic coach still, and I was um, working with friends and stuff, and I was getting myself reconnected to my own big why and and what I want to do, and and that that my future is bigger than my past, right? Like what I've done, everything I've done up to today, and I believe this is is the the proving grounds for what the next thing is or the preparation for the next thing right and that you're going to keep going and keep pushing through so that the thing that that got me through that time was focusing on the future so being future focused um and knowing that my future believing that my future was going to be bigger and that i could accomplish anything that i want to do you know i set out my sights i reminded myself of how i when i was first starting out my business, how I was fearing When you're with the copy machine in the living room. Exactly, the copy machine in the living room. And and uh, you joke, I'm going to find a picture that I'm going to send it to I you. want it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to find it. I'm going to find it. It was a Canon machine. I'll never forget it. Um, because I remember having to throw it out too. Um, <laughs> it was heavy. Um, but anyway, you know, it's like I, I was fearless in that moment, right? Like I knew I didn't have the kids. I didn't have all the same expenses and responsibilities and whatever. And so, like, I was willing to take a lot of risks. And over time, when you get more and more success or whatever, you're sometimes – I, I was a little bit less willing to take some risks and, and, and less being – less willing to be visible – have a vision of the future because I was lost. And so so what I'm very good at now is um, I write down uh, some three things I'm grateful for every day, mm-hmm. and I think about the future and what I'm going to do, and that's changed everything for me. What's so, the big why now? Uh, I want to help other entrepreneurs uh, be successful and live the lives that they want. So my goal for the next five years is to help 10,000 entrepreneurs, and then I'm going to go bigger with that goal. But I want to work with 10,000 businesses. I want to help them through developing a customer-centric mindset, uh, really understand how to grow their business, how to create the systems and processes in their business. I'm going to let them work on their business, not just in their business, create more value, make a whole lot more money, make their competition virtually disappear by doing the right thing for the customers. And I've done it with many people before, but I want to do it exclusively with small business entrepreneurs now and help them do that. So really what excited. about the proudest moment in your in the journey? Or one uh, of the proudest moments? Uh, there's so many. Uh, I've had a lot of pride, proud moments. I mean, I think one of the things that I was, uh, well, a few different things, you know, selling the business was fine, you know, and it was, it was not what I set out to do. I had set out to get investors for the business and we ended up selling it because we, we were pulled in that direction. So when you set out to get investors, they were like, we want to buy this. Yeah, that's, that was the problem. So it's yeah, a we good, were trying to good just, problem, right? I, I'm not complaining, yeah. but it was that's, I think that's why I wasn't mentally prepared also. Like right. I wasn't, I wasn't in that place. I wanted right. to do this for the rest of my life, which is why I'm so excited that I'm doing this now. Um, but I think, you know, um, I was, uh, I was recognized in uh, 2009 by Ernst and Young for Entrepreneur of the Year. Yeah. And um, just the the recognition and the the, the the nicest thing about that was people that were in my life um, acknowledged me in a way just through letters that they sent to me. It had nothing to do with the ceremony itself, but when they saw that, read that, and, and just shared like really wonderful things that they appreciated about the mm. relationship with me. And I think sometimes we kind of don't share that with other people. So right. like expressing the gratitude, like feeling what people were grateful for from our relationship was was moving. And at that moment, it had happened. And two other times also the strategic coach program, they make you uh, they make you they ask you to do this exercise to figure out what your unique your, your unique ability is. Yeah. Maybe send out a letter to people that are in your circle and say, you know, you've known me for a while. What most impresses you about who I am or what I'm doing and um, the, the responses that come. Yeah. What did they say about you? Huge. Um that uh, oh, well, I got a bunch of different ones, but one of them was um, that I have this uh, uncanny ability to use both the right brain and the left brain of my mind at the same exact time. So I'm able to create really creative, but also implementable solutions. Mm. Um, one of them was that I'm a tremendous leader and motivator of other people. That I inspire people to action, yeah. uh, which I thought was really, really wonderful. Yeah. A lot of people talked about creativity. I mean, you you said that earlier too, but um, and I I value creativity. You know, one. One of the times I was at a, an event and someone said, you know, if you could only leave like one thing to uh, someone, you're on a desert island and you're going to die and this other person is going to go on, then what would you leave with them with? It was like, you know, I want you to be creative. I want you to think creatively about anything yeah. that comes your way because I think, you know, all, most of my successes in life, um, and I'm sure uh, other people probably feel the same way, they come out of, of periods of 
failure or or stuckness where right. you're you're, or you're blocked. Yeah. I think that that ability to like just get outside of it for a second, like don't internalize it, and just think creatively about that situation. What else could you do? How else could you handle it? Whatever is a is a gift, you know. So for me, um, you know, that's that's important. It's an important yeah. part of my life. So. That's such a big value for you. Jason, what do you, how do you instill that in your kids? Like, what do you do with your kids to foster their creativity or get them thinking differently? Um, that's interesting. So my older son, um, Jack, he is like super duper creative. Like he just, he's imaginative. Like he, he does all sorts of like crazy play. Like he'll think of like different scenarios and he'll act them out and, and, um, come up with, um, you know, plays and skits and things like right. that. It's like theatrical, like superheroes or whatever it happens to be, but just always thinking of different things. Like he's, he's talked about different ways that he would create a business in the future and, hmm. you know, use it to change the world and make it a better place and, you know, what have you. So it's kind of interesting. My other one, um, you know, right now he's planning to be a ninja when he grows up. So we'll see what happens with Josh. <laughs> uh, he's, he's very focused on that. But, but what's interesting, like this morning, um, we were talking at breakfast and he's been watching how a lot of kids his age are creating YouTube videos. Mm. And he said to me, he's like, Dad, I'd like to create a video. And so our plan for this weekend is to shoot a video. Get him and, on right now. Where is he? And to do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's, uh, <laughs> I think he's at home having a okay. plate swimming pool. But, uh, but you know, he, he's, he, he's been, like, looking at how people are creating videos. And, like, their kids are, like, doing reviews of games, like, that they like and how they like to do that and whatever. And I think it's a skill, right, as we look at how the world's changing, like, we're doing this right now. Like, why not start when you're six? How great would you be when you're – Amazing. You know, Amazing. So, you know, so he asked to do that. And uh, I thought, wow, like, that would be pretty cool. Um and he's been like researching and he's like, I've got a bunch of topics I'd like to talk about. I was like, really? Okay. What's he going to talk yeah. about? I'm really curious. I don't know. Yeah, we didn't go through. I, I will definitely, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to need everyone's help on this uh, podcast to help me promote my kid's YouTube channel. So I'll, uh, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll love to do, do it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that, you know, and you know, just, just, I think letting them be imaginative and, and, and not like, I think my parents, um, were pretty supportive, although I remember my father saying to me when I was going to go to theater school, he's like, so I'm going to pay for you to go to school for you to go to shop class and like point some lights at things like that's ridiculous. You know, so like we had that argument. And I was like, I think it'll turn out OK. Like, let's like, you know, settle down. Um, <laughs> and, and he did. And he supported me. And, and then afterwards, he came back and said to me, oh, I wish I did what you do. You know, so wow. that was interesting. But, you know, but. I just I want them to experience and explore different things, and yeah. so if they want to try something, we try and encourage them to to try it. And um, I try not to push him in, them into anything, because I feel like, you know, I, I don't naturally wanna... kind of gravitate towards things. Like they're like like my Jack is like super interested in different things, and he goes hyper like responsive and deep into certain things that he loves. And I'd rather you know like he, it's like funny like at school like he he hates math because of the way they give him math to do. But he is super good at math, and so when it's yeah. in the context of science, right. not math, he's awesome at it. And so, like, yeah. it's I just want them to kind of explore and and you know and do that if and uh, and and kind of see what what they like. I love focusing on strengths, you know what I mean. So uh, yeah. I think it raises all everything raises up yeah. together. So. Jason, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your your knowledge and uh, expertise uh, with everyone. Um, where should we point people towards? Obviously, um, I mean, the, where I've been checking out and, and reading through the blog posts and is cxformula.com. Um, and then obviously you mentioned uh, go.cxformula.com backslash inspired insider if they want to get the, um, the ebook on the seven mistakes. Anywhere else we should point people towards? I think that's good for the moment. You know, um, we're going to have... Talk uh, about the program a little bit because... Um, cause you offer, I mean, beyond the seven customer experience killers, um, what else? Yeah, we have a couple of things. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, just, just to cap off on the other thing, we're gonna, we're gonna be launching a podcast, um, right after the first of the year, okay. which will be talking about, uh, all sorts of great customer experience things. So, um, stay tuned for that. And, uh, and I'm not sure when exactly this, uh, is going to go live, but, um, by, I hope by the time this is live, our website will be updated because there's a new one that I just looked at this morning that looks awesome. Uh, that's uh, replacing the last one. That's going to have a bunch more information and and blog posts and and media and content stuff on there. So so definitely check those out. 
Um, as far as our program, we offer a couple different ways uh, that people can work with us. The, the, one, the first thing is we have a program called the CX Formula um, Online Workshop. And basically, we take people through a 10-week training program. And, it's, and I say training, but it's really in, interactive. It's, a, it's both online learning through some videos and stuff, some homework. And then we have coaching calls where we literally get on and mm-hmm. work with you and coach you. So it's a real interactive program that will help you go from – you know, zero to 60 on your experience very quickly. And people leave that program with a very clear understanding of what they need to do. They've actually started implementing some of it and they've started seeing the benefits of, you know, raving customer fans, viral word of mouth and a growth in revenue and some reduction in costs. So that's, that's one way to do it. We also have a workshop that you can um, add on the end of that, which is a two day customer journey mapping workshop where you come in and we work with you and you can bring in as many of your team members as you like. You know, we have to pay for them, but you know, you can bring them in and we literally go through and work on your entire customer journey. Um, we map it all out so that you have a really huge actionable plan, very visual, but also like implementable action items from that. Um, we do some private group uh, coaching and we do some private one-on-one coaching or, or, or work with people. So um, depending on the, the fit, you know, we'll, we'll do a few limited client engagements like that uh, each year. So, yeah. And you said there's a mastermind too. Oh yeah. Well, so that's, that's not, that's kind of like private by invitation only, yeah. but we do, I do have a, a mastermind and that's for, um, I would say up to a million dollars in revenue. Um, no more than that. It wouldn't be in a peer group at that point, but it's, you know, zero to, to a million. I think uh, the highest person there's got a million. Um, and, you know, it's it's a way to have a peer interaction, and we do some. It's 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 a it's a hybrid coaching slash mastermind program. So it's not full mastermind. There's some coaching, yeah. and it's for people that are in a variety of businesses. We have both online businesses and bricks and mortar. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, the culture of that group is important. Um, I want to keep it small. I think there's like four uh, or five four four. I think there's four slots in that group that are uh, possibly available, but I'm not in a rush. You like to, fill to keep them. it I small. Just, I want to keep it small and I want to keep it intimate and I want to keep it the right fit. So I won't put any competitive businesses in there because we get really, you know, into uh, a lot of detail and uh, the community. It's It's got the uh, it's got like a real gestalt of how we operate it. And it's also got a lot of confidentiality. Um, so I don't want people to feel uncomfortable sharing anything. Um, so I don't put any competitive businesses yeah. in there. And you got to have a, a, a really the right mindset and the right cultural yeah. fit. So you've uh, done so- many masterminds and many groups and many much coaching who who do you consider some of your mentors who do you go to when you need business advice uh well i've got a tremendous amount of friends that have that are definitely mentors yeah. that i that i go to um like on a more specific way like i'm in uh, a group called the genius network with joe polish i think you know that so well, dan cashel introduced us yeah, yeah dan definitely dan. Introduced us. yeah yeah that's awesome um so i'm in that group um so so not only is Joe and Dan and uh, mentors, but but there's a lot of people in that group that are just amazing at different things. So you get uh, you get a really wonderful uh, group of people to to choose from to meet. And obviously that's how I met you. So the the network just expands from there. Yeah. Uh, strategic coach, you know Dan Sullivan uh, has been a coach of mine for uh, many 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 years. Um, so uh, the strategic coach has been a, a great program. I'm also in uh, Jeff Walker's Platinum Plus Mastermind. Yeah. So. Uh, just some real badass people in that group. Uh, Both groups uh, are badass various people. Levels. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're all they're all our uh, really great programs. So I've been very fortunate um, to be involved in those programs, and and yeah. I I learn. I'm a I'm a learner. I'm a student. You know, I I'm as much as I can teach and help other people. I'm also learning more stuff, and I'm integrating it, and I'm figuring out how to iterate um, stuff that I'm doing now and add newest, greatest, latest kind of stuff into it. So um, so I love that. Yeah, you know, it's fun. A lot of fun. Jason, this has been so much fun. I really appreciate oh, it. This is great. So I love it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Everyone check it out, cxformula.com. You should check it out just for the mere fact of, I mean, for one, there's an amazing book there with the seven customer experience killers, but to see how they actually work up their you know, customer experience for that. So, so Check us out. So, thanks, thanks Jason. Jeremy. All right. Have a great one. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.